got something that might interest you. <laughs> oh, what the hell? Got a selection of good things on sale, stranger. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of No One Cares. Our first vid of 2021, in fact. Welcome to a new year of the same old shit. And unfortunately, but thematically appropriately, we're starting with some bad news. Open Bazaar will be closing its doors in the very near future. Now, if you've never heard of Open Bazaar before, I wouldn't blame you, but it's a supposedly decentralized, cryptocurrency-based buy-and-sell page. Not actually a page, it's more of a piece of software that you'd install on your computer, it would connect to other users of the same software in a sort of peer-to-peer -peer fashion, and people could post sell offers for whatever they want to sell, I don't know, furniture, books, clothes, anything you can think of. Post a, a price in cryptocurrency, buyers would come along and take the deals, they'd swap crypto, ship the items, and Bob's your uncle. Sounds like a great idea. Unfortunately, it is no longer functional. Although I should clarify, it's not actually Open Bazaar that's closing its doors. Open Bazaar is the software. Actually, it's OB1, a company that works on the development of Open Bazaar that's closing its doors due to lack of funding. Now, it may seem counterintuitive, but this decentralized piece of software apparently depends on OB1 to maintain a lot of critical infrastructure. Things like seed nodes, API endpoints, and of course, people doing maintenance on their code and whatnot. But with the company out of commission, all of this vital infrastructure will no longer be maintained, which means Open Bazaar will no longer be functional. Now, I have no confirmation on this as of yet, but Haven, the Android front end to Open Bazaar, which I have talked about in previous videos, I'm going to assume that's also out of commission, although I'm going to put a question mark on there. I'm not entirely sure, but since Haven is just an Android like package for the Open Bazaar system, I'm going to assume without the underpinning Open Bazaar working, it's no longer functional. But don't quote me on that. I could be wrong. Now, all of this is sad to see, of course. You know, a cryptocurrency peer-to-peer -peer buy and sell page sounds like exactly the thing that's up my alley, and you'd be right. I really like the idea of it. But the shutting down of Obi-Wan is not entirely surprising if you look into its history. As recently as September 2020, Obi-Wan was actually on the verge of bankruptcy and put out an appeal for community funding to keep the doors open and the lights on. Now, at that time, not shortly after they made the announcement, an anonymous donor decided to throw enough money at them to keep the lights on until December 31st, but that was only temporary. The funds have run out, there's nothing more to gather, so it looks like Obi-Wan is closing its doors and all of their projects are going with it. And I have to say, the whole experience was a little surprising to me because I never realized that Open Bazaar as a piece of software was this dependent on Obi-Wan as a company to keep it running. I mean, obviously, as a piece of software, the code needs maintenance, the API needs maintenance. There's some sort of infrastructure that does need to be maintained, sure. And nobody can demand free work of the people writing the code for it. But at the same time, the fact that uh, Open Bazaar is so dependent on OB1 that a bankruptcy of the company means that it cannot function at all, really it's hard to say that the software was actually decentralized in any meaningful way. And the more I dug into Obi-Wan's past, the more evident the problems became with it. In its initial run-up, it was very dependent on venture capital funding, you know, the sort of thing that usually comes with strings attached, and an expectation of future profitability. In addition, Haven app, I've talked about this before, heavily depended on G apps being on your phone. I tried to run Haven on a phone that didn't have G apps, and yeah, it didn't work at all. And it seemed kind of weird to me that a decentralized cryptocurrency marketplace app would be so dependent on centralized corporate run infrastructure. On top of that, Haven itself wasn't open sourced until much later in its development cycle, and it turned out that the developers were actually holding out on open sourcing to try and bait for a buyout offer from a deep-pocketed investor, which to me is a bad sign of where their priorities lie. But still, in spite of all of that, Open Bazaar closing its doors is sad to see. It does, however, highlight a problem that I think more broadly speaking is, well, it's disappointing to see how many of these so-called decentralized projects are being organized between centralized corporate entities, LLCs, you know, non-profit organizations, or what have you. 
There are a lot of people who want to claim that these entities are necessary, of course, that they provide some sort of legal protection or financial resources, a vessel for ownership of the domain for the site, management of, of the site or whatever else. And this may be true, but whatever benefits you get from creating a centralized corporate entity like what Obi-Wan represented to Open Bazaar, they also introduce critical central points of failure. And obviously, Obi-Wan is a great example of this. Open Bazaar cannot function without the company holding up the infrastructure behind it. Now, I don't think this is necessary. Far from it. I think you can look at a lot of other projects and see that they run along just fine in a decentralized, distributed, federated fashion without any corporation, LLC, or NPO to run them. Look at Plerima and the Fediverse, or look at BISC, uh, the decentralized cryptocurrency marketplace. There is some sort of management, but there's no corporate entity. They run along just fine without it. So it isn't really necessary. There may be people maintaining the code, etc., but it can be done by a loosely organized group of individuals. If you look at BISC's DAO, their Decentralized Autonomous Organization, you can see a way that they take it even a step further, creating a kind of code-based pseudonymous, non-corporate, but still structured way to manage their group. And if you actually look at BISC's page, I think they summarize it very succinctly when they say, uh, let's see here, revenue distribution and decision making cannot be decentralized with traditional organization structures. They require legal entities, jurisdictions, bank accounts, and more, all of which are central points of failure. The BISC DAO replaces such legacy infrastructure with cryptographic infrastructure to handle project decision-making and revenue distribution without such central points of failure. And as somebody who's functioned inside the BISC DAO as admittedly a very minor player participating in translation, I've seen it in action and it's very efficient. I have absolutely no idea who anybody else in the organization is, save for their screen names, but I can do work, submit proof of my work, and get compensated for that work, all in a way that's cryptographically provable and, well, very difficult to defraud. There are people in charge, there are administrators and managers, of course, but there's no legal corporate entity. There's no list of names. And that's a very important point, which I'll get into in a bit. Now, of course, this approach is not flawless, but... It doesn't need to be. Even the best decentralized project, even the best open source project can lose support. Maintainers can drop out, the code can get old and unmaintained and no longer compatible. Sure, that can all happen. But the point with all of these types of decentralized, federated, etc. projects is not to build flawless systems. That's impossible. What you want to do is build systems that can survive faults, that can route around damage and continue to function no matter what gets thrown at them. Maybe they'll fail, maybe they'll fall apart, but you want to at least plan around the potential for your failure. A good example of this, of course, is open source development of code. Open source means that new maintainers can step in and take over if old maintainers are unable or unwilling to continue developing a program. It's not easy, necessarily, sure, but there's fewer legal roadblocks compared to if everything was owned by a corporate entity that was concerned with its intellectual property. Somebody, an individual or a group of individuals who write a bunch of code, release it under an open source license, are essentially future-proofing their project because it means they're accepting that even if they drop out, it is not impossible for a new actor to easily step in, scoop up what's left, and expand on it into the future. It's essentially a project planning around the possibility of its own obsolescence, or at least its own, you know, loss of leadership so that somebody else can take over. That is true future-proofing. That is true forward thinking. And I don't think you can ever get that if you organize yourself as a company. And really, the whole situation makes me feel that it's, it's a shame and a waste of potential, because a decentralized marketplace like what Open Bazaar was at least trying to accomplish, a place where people can come together to buy and sell goods and services with cryptocurrency without the need for any central entity overlooking it, is an important thing. I think we need that. Perhaps, you know, I, I'm not the majority view here, but I think we need to replace legacy institutions whether they're financial or corporate or otherwise. And depending on a large corporation to be able to buy and sell things is just another vector for powerful people to keep you down, keep you in a box, and keep you under control. Breaking out of that means we need to create something a little bit more 
peer-to-peer in the sense of person-to-person, not reliant on a centralized corporate entity. Now, it's certainly true that Open Bazaar wasn't a hugely popular piece of software, hence the reason it fell apart, but it's still important infrastructure to develop and maintain for a possible future, right? We don't know what's going to come along this year. 2020 was already a huge fucking year. So many things changed so fast, nobody could keep up. I think we want to build and maintain infrastructure to prepare for the kind of future we might want to build, rather than wait for the trouble to happen and play catch up against it. But, that being said, it's important to remember as we build out this infrastructure that any sort of decentralized marketplace for goods and services, anything that allows individuals to buy, sell, and trade as individuals, is going to run in diametric opposition to those same centralized corporate powers, right? The likes of Amazon and Walmart, just to name a few, really don't want to countenance the rivalry of an entity that they can't buy out or legally sue into oblivion. And I think corporate power and state power generally go hand in hand, especially in the modern year. So the likes of Amazon especially, and Walmart certainly, they won't hesitate to use their government connections to crush any rivals that appear. If you're organized as a company or an NPO or an NGO or whatever, it's a lot easier for them to do that. Now, if the year 2020 has taught its lessons, and if you were paying attention, I hope it did, then you have to understand that the decentralized marketplace app of the future must be built with certain assumptions in mind. And I think these are assumptions that Open Bazaar and Obi Wan failed to keep in mind. But the first of these is that the law is not your friend. And yes, I know I'm, I'm going full libertarian, no roads here, but worrying about shit like regulatory compliance is willingly putting a slave collar around your neck. You have to know that these laws will never work to your advantage. They will only work to the advantage of your bigger, more deeper pocketed rivals and their government connections. Any rules that are not advantageous to corporate players will be changed. Any rules that allow them to squash their smaller rivals will be strengthened and built upon. So, yeah, the law will never be your friend at this point. That leads into the second point to keep in mind, of course, your major rivals will not play fair. Whatever rules or laws exist will be twisted or ignored to let big fish off the hook while their smaller rivals get crushed underfoot. Similarly to that, your third point, developers will be targeted. Of course, anybody trying to get out of the corporate-controlled, government-controlled system, well, that's basically cattle trying to get off the ranch, right? They're going to get sought out and made examples of. So if you are a developer of a piece of decentralized cryptocurrency-based software, you really should know that you're painting a target on your back. The last thing you want to do is have your name listed next to your title, right? CEO, CFO, whatever the fuck you are. Having a big web page on LinkedIn with all of your corporate connections, it's a great way to get your reputation ruined, or worse, have you mysteriously disappear one day and end up in the fucking foundation stone of a highway overpass. Do you think I'm exaggerating? I don't think so. At some point, these players are going to get desperate and angry enough that they're going to start scrubbing their rivals, no matter how they have to do it. And lastly, the important thing to remember is to disregard the tyranny of public relations and respectability. There's going to be any number of concern trolls who are going to try to paint decentralization as a hub of crime and villainy. Now, it's certainly true that crime is going to happen, but these same trolls are happy to ignore massive crimes that are enabled and perpetrated by the centralized power of both government and corporations. Crime is going to happen. Criminals are very resourceful, and they already have ways to do bad shit, and in many cases they're doing it with assistance from governments, or big corporations, or banks, or investment firms. So what the fuck is the difference if another alternative exists that also gives individuals the power to work out something for themselves, to buy, sell, and trade on their own? If crime is going to happen anyway, whether big or small, in my mind the best thing to do is strengthen individuals against it, not weaken them. So, with all that in mind, with Open Bazaar off the table now, what kind of alternatives do we have to look at right now? Well, there are two in mind, neither of which are perfect, but uh, the first one, Particle.io. Very similar to Open Bazaar, it's a piece of software you download and install onto your computer, it's got a built-in wallet, it's got its own built-in services, and you do the same thing. Post a sell offer, take a buyer, work out a deal, trade cryptocurrency, send the item, Bob's your uncle. Now, Particle has at least one very interesting piece of technology that got my attention, which was the MAD multi-sig escrow. MAD, in this case, being mutually assured destruction. 
Now, the escrow service in Particle is very similar to what happens in BISC, right? You have a multi-sig wallet, there's more than one person who controls the wallet. All parties, in this case buyer and seller, both have to agree before the wallet will send money out. So you put your money into the wallet as an escrow service, and the money will only go out of the wallet to the seller when both parties agree that the deal is finished. BISC has this sort of service, it works reasonably well for that, but I think Particle has a, an interesting addition to that, the mutually assured destruction escrow wallet. What this means is that when the buyer and seller make a deal, both of them need to put in a certain amount of collateral. It could be a percentage of the total price of the item, maybe 50%, maybe 75%, maybe 100%. But both buyer and seller put their funds into the escrow wallet, the buyer, of course, puts in also the cost of what they want to buy, and the funds are locked up, pending both parties being satisfied with the deal being closed. Where the mutually assured destruction part comes into play is that there is a fixed time limit. Both parties agree on this time limit when they start the deal. Could be any length of time, could be a month, could be a week, whatever you want. This time limit can be changed. Both players can decide that they want to extend it by a week or by a month or maybe shorten it, I'm not sure. But both parties need to agree to any changes in the time limit. In any case, once the time limit is locked in, the wallet will begin to count down towards the end of that limit. Once you hit the end of the time limit, the wallet will completely lock down, not allowing any party to move their funds out of the wallet. Now, when you hear that, you might ask yourself, why the fuck would I want that? That sounds like a way I might lose my money. Well, this is sort of to light a fire under the ass of both parties to get the deal done as quickly as possible. Because you have to think of this in terms of being the buyer, right? If you have to put up, let's say, $10 to buy a book, and you also have to put in $5 in collateral, if the seller is legit and sells you the item, you stand to lose more money by fucking around than by just signing off on the deal and getting your collateral back. Additionally, if you are the seller, well, you have to lock your collateral in before you send the item. So if you fuck around, you're potentially not only out the item you lost, but also your collateral and the money you could have made. So you really have no incentive not to go through with the deal. So by having a time limit, you make it especially difficult for either party to want to drag their heels or try and make the deal like go over time or do anything else to fuck around with it. Everybody kind of wants to get this over with as quickly as possible. So it leads to both parties wanting to settle it in an amicable fashion more quickly. Now, is that a perfect system? Probably not, but I think it's a good extension that makes the, uh, the usual fears of cheating and fraud at least a little bit less likely. Now, I really like that idea, and I really wish I could say that I gave Particle.io my recommendation, but unfortunately, Particle is organized behind the Particle Foundation, which is a non-profit organization registered in Switzerland. Now, is this meaningfully different from OB1 Inc.? Well, I'm going to have to say probably not. This is a centralized legal entity, and it's probably maintaining some form of critical infrastructure. So if Particle.io can't survive the collapse of the Particle Foundation, I guess it's really not any better than Open Bazaar. The second alternative is kind of a speculative alternative at this point, but the Float Marketplace, brought to you by the same people who made Float the social media site which I remember at some point I thought was going to be a crypto crowdfunding site, but I'll leave that gripe aside. Now, the founders of Float are talking about releasing it in the near future, but there's still nothing concrete to, to latch onto yet, so I don't know what it's going to look like when it comes out. I will say it's a welcome addition to the landscape, like having more alternatives to go to is better than fewer alternatives, but again, this is organized behind a private for-profit company. Float as a company is registered in California, it has named CEOs, so all of the flaws and problems I mentioned before, well, those are still pretty valid here. It's the same flaw again. Float Inc. is the central point of failure. Neither of these options is bad per se, but as I've already made clear, unless the central point of failure issue is addressed, it's essentially the glowing herniated weak spot waiting to be struck for massive damage by the big players who want to shut down their rivals. And as an end user, it's very difficult to go all in on either platform when, you know, you know that the foundations could crumble at any point, like Obi-Wan did, and there's no plan to function beyond that. Neither one of these entities, as far as I can tell, are planning for their own obsolescence, and that's a problem. I want a platform that's designed to survive the destruction of the entity that created it. I'm not seeing that so far.
Now, I'd really like to see an alternative that actually embraces the points I mentioned before, and I think the BISC DAO has shown that software can be maintained and funded outside the need for centralized legal entities. If somebody plans on making a marketplace app operating on the same principles, that would be ideal. But unfortunately, it doesn't exist yet. And since I have no programming knowledge or skill to speak of, I certainly can't step up to the plate myself. I can only hope that somebody else will. Now, it certainly is possible for individuals to come up with some sort of solution on their own, of course. I mean, there's a piece of software I may have mentioned in the past called Nunchuck. It's essentially a DIY multi-sig wallet. You could set it up, you could have your buyer and seller make keys for the wallet, you could create your own escrow, and then just use like a private encrypted messenger app of your choice to communicate and arrange shipping and receiving. But unfortunately, that's all a little bit clumsy and spread out. Having everything all under one roof with one control panel and one program would be a lot more convenient, and I think that would drive a lot more users and engagement, which is probably important if you want your software to get any sort of critical mass. So, what do we learn from all of this? Well, bottom line, I would say making a company or an NGO or an NPO is playing by a rulebook written by the people who want to oppress us. You know, I may sound like a cartoon supervillain in saying this, but playing inside the safety lines written by those people only means that you're going to fail. They want you to fail, and that's why they set up the lines in such a way that you will. Obviously, if you organize as a company, you can get bought out by your legacy rivals. If you don't get bought out, then the venture capital sharks are going to swim around you and attach strings to any funding they give you. The government can make sudden regulatory changes that can completely scupper your whole business plan if you're dependent on obeying the law to function, etc. There are any number of pitfalls that are created by being a good, clean, legal entity that obeys all the rules. Because as I said before, the rules don't fucking matter. The people who make the rules will fuck you, and if the rules aren't fucking you hard enough, they'll change the rules so that you get fucked as hard as you need to be fucked. And again, I don't mean to sound like some sort of ultra-libertarian roads are bad type, but I really feel that there are seismic shifts coming in the way the world works, if they're not already underway. And I think if you want to survive to see the other end of it, we all need to be planning and building outside of the lines that are drawn on the ground for us. If we don't have a plan for how we're going to continue functioning, you know, as individuals, as groups, as a society, beyond the institutions that are currently running the world, I think we're going to be in a bad way very soon. And we do have to plan on the eventuality that the legacy industries are going to become more violent and desperate as they begin to circle the drain. I'm not really interested in enabling drug dealers, I'm not really interested in enabling pedophiles, but if those people happen to benefit, from a broad, you know, grassroots, person-to-person, peer-to-peer system that helps everybody become stronger. Well, that doesn't seem like it's such a bad future to me. There's always going to be bad actors. We'll just have to find ways to deal with them while making sure that we don't also make people too weak to deal with the changes that are going to come. That's how I feel about it anyway. I don't know. I hope we can get some decent alternative come the future. Anyway, that's all I have to say about that. Thank you for listening. I hope this year is better than last, but I really don't have my hopes up. Have a nice day. Speaking of decentralized alternatives to legacy centralized services, social media is another area in desperate need of good alternatives. Facebook and Twitter are the kings of censorship, sure, but the alternatives popping up to replace them are showing some censorious tendencies of their own. Wouldn't it be nice if real decentralized alternatives existed? Actually, they do. Introducing 10 Friends. 10 Friends is a project designed to help you and your friends create your own free, decentralized social media spaces run by your own rules. Whether you want to share music, videos, or just shit post among friends, there are tools that fit nearly all your needs. Visit us at 10friends.info, join our mailing list for future updates, and check out our wiki to find out how you can build these spaces for yourself. One person in every group of friends has the skills to do it, and that one person might be you. 10 Friends. Your space by your rules.